Why, hello there, and welcome back to Some Weirdo on the Internet Reviews Obscure Role-Playing Games, and the third part in my three-part series on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles role-playing game. For some reason. After the Bomb was released in 2001 by Palladium and is basically an updated version of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other strangeness, but now with the alternative post-apocalyptic setting as the default setting and no Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles license because it was probably expensive at this point. And I did a whole video on the evolution of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other strangeness into After the Bomb, so if you want that whole story, you can watch that video. But for now, let's just get into the setting. After the Bomb is set in the post-apocalypse of a world where genetic engineering had advanced to the point of becoming consumer technology, leading to things like animal people and designer diseases. And then when one of the latter got loose and kind of killed or mutated a large amount of the animal population, all the world governments thought it was a biological attack and launched retaliatory nuclear strikes and, uh, bam! Post-apocalyptic world with animal people. Overall, it is a fairly standard post-apocalyptic setting, but I do like the inclusion of genetic engineering as the catalyst for events, and also they do go into a bit of depth on a world where humans and animal people have to coexist, or fail to do so, and they do go into quite a bit of detail on the locations and organizations, etc., unless those things happen to be in a different book, but... More on that later. So a 2 out of 3 for the setting. It goes a little bit deeper than the average post-apocalyptic setting, but let's be honest here, the average post-apocalyptic setting just isn't very good. Players in After the Bomb take on the role of mutant animals who are generally human-like to some degree or humans, who are also generally human-like to some degree, and this gets complicated real quick, so let's just jump into it. There are basically two kinds of muted animal in this game, basic animals and purebreds, like the pleasure bunnies, which are rabbits that have been genetically engineered to be sexy humanoids. This also includes throwbacks, which are either intentionally or unintentionally resurrected species, like a chicken that's had its dormant dinosaur genes activated, and chimeras, which are genetic crossbreeds, like spider goats or the Porkopolis flying pigs. These are all things that are in this game. So let's get this going by rolling up our 8 attributes with 3d6 each, and if the result is 16 or higher, we add an additional d6. Now we roll for our animal type and specific animal, and it looks like we are making a crow. Our species gives us some attribute bonuses and sets our starting size, which also modifies our attributes and sets our structural damage capacity, or SDC. Then we roll for our background, which is villager. This gives us additional attribute bonuses, as well as our skills and equipment, which I will get to later. But for now, let's deal with being a crow. Basically, our character starts as a crow, just one with human-level intellect and none of a crow's natural abilities. As a crow, we have 70 BioE points that we can spend on increasing our size, gaining human attributes, crow abilities, and psionic abilities. We also have the option of taking vestigial traits for additional BioE points. So let's increase our size to 6, which also gets rid of our size penalties. And for human attributes as a bird, things get a little weird. We automatically get full bipedal stance as, you know, birds are feathered bipeds as humans are featherless bipeds. And since we have wings instead of arms or forelegs, we have the option to either get full or partial hands on our wings or a whole new set of arms in addition to our wings. And we are going to go with that one since the wing hands give a penalty on most things requiring hands. And just for convenience, we'll take full human speech. Then we'll take the no bird wings or tail disadvantage to get 15 extra BioE points because the flight abilities are really expensive. Then we'll get some talons, extra intelligence quotient which gives a plus 5 bonus to said attribute, and vocal effects which lets us mimic sounds. Then we'll spend the rest of our points on some psionic abilities and there's that. 
Our background gives us a selection of apprenticeships, so let's go with Healer, which gives us a number of skills with additional bonuses, and also a number of skills with no additional bonuses. And some skills also give us bonuses to our attributes and or abilities, and those are our skills. And now that our attributes are all set, we get a bonus for each attribute over 15, excluding speed. And three of our attributes have a function if not over 15, but the others do not. Our background gives us some equipment and money with which we can buy more equipment. And now that we have all of our bonuses and equipment, we can fill in all of our combat stats, then the miscellaneous stuff, and this character is done. And that is the abbreviated version. If you want more details, you can watch the full 11 minute character creation walkthrough I did for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Other Strangeness. They are basically the same game, and we made a frog in that one. Overall, it is something of a long and complicated process and not without other faults, but for me, the really big thing is the massive selection of animal options. Like, you have over a hundred options, and then each animal has various customization options that you can customize your character with. Like, a regular complaint of mine when it comes to anthropomorphic animal characters in RPGs is not getting access to the animal's natural abilities. But here, if you are a beaver, you can have gnawing teeth and a functional beaver tail and natural building instincts, provided that you want to spend the majority of your points on those. And that is another issue. It does feel a bit like they gave you exactly enough points to build the type of mutant animal that they want you to, Although it was actually worse in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle game, and of course, you are free to disregard things like human attributes and an appropriate size, and just make your character a giant guinea pig, or a tiny elephant with psychic powers. So a 4 out of 5 for character creation, it is a system that has some moderate issues, but it also offers a fair amount of freedom and an absurd number of options. The base mechanics are fairly simple, presumably, more on that later, when you want to make a skill check, you roll percentile dice and succeed if the result is less than your skill rating, with various skills having additional specific rules attached to them. Now combat doesn't use those mechanics, and will be explained now, unfortunately. Alright, so let's say that our character has run afoul of... a giant guinea pig. Both combatants roll initiative for the first melee, and it seems that the giant guinea pig gets the first attack. The guinea pig has three attacks per melee, and our crow has five. The guinea pig comes at us with a headbutt, rolling a d20 to strike with a plus three bonus. Any attack roll over four is a hit, however our character has the option to dodge at the cost of one attack. So we roll our dodge and get an 8. Because the dodge was less than the attack roll, the attack hits, and damage is rolled. But because the attack roll did not exceed our armor rating, the damage is applied to our armor's SDC. And now it's our turn. We spend one attack action to draw our revolver. I assume it doesn't actually say that anywhere, but the disarm rules say that it costs an action to draw another weapon after being disarmed, so yeah. We roll to attack, and the guinea pig spends an action to dodge, but does not succeed as dodge attempts against firearms are made at a minus 10 penalty, and the damage is dealt to their SDC. Hypothetically, if a character were to lose all their SDC, then damage would be applied to their hit points. Then the guinea pig attacks again, but this time our dodge is successful. So we attack again, but since the guinea pig has no actions left, they just have to take the damage. And now that all involved are out of actions, the whole thing starts over again with initiative, but I think we've done enough of this. And that was what that was. Definitely a way to get around the fact that roll under percentile systems are just not great for combat. It is one of those things where, like, I understand what they were trying to do, and I think that they did an okay job executing that thing, but also 
it seems like that thing would get really, really tedious really, really fast. So a two and a half out of five for mechanics. The big thing for me is that the rules just feel very dated and not dated in the sense that this game came out almost 20 years ago, more like dated in the sense that the rules themselves are almost 40 years old. So this game has an okay amount of stuff in it, but the real issue is what it doesn't have in it. Like, aside from weapons and armor, there is almost no equipment in the book, which is very notable if you compare it to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Other Strangeness, which this is an updated version of, but has less equipment then. And that's the thing here, is this is supposed to be After the Bomb, the complete role-playing game, but they didn't really make much use of the six books worth of content that had come before it. Now, I'm not saying that they intentionally left content out of the book with hopes of selling off some of their old stock of After the Bomb supplements, but there sure are a lot of notes in this book referring you to those books in place of actual content. So a 2 out of 3 for content, it is objectively okay, but my main issue is the massive amount of content that they had at their disposal, but chose not to include for reasons. Overall, this book doesn't really feel like it was exactly written, or Rather, various parts of it were written at various times over the preceding 20 years, and then all of those parts were cobbled together into something resembling a role-playing game, and they added some shiny new bits on top and uh, called it a book. Like, remember when I explained presumably how skill checks worked? That's because the book doesn't actually explain how you make a skill check. Okay, that's not fair. It is mentioned in the impersonation and canoe building skills. But never at any point do they say, here is how you make a skill check. And it's not just that one thing, like, character creation and combat are the only parts of the rules that they actually put coherent effort into explaining. And while not including important information in this book, they also were able to include completely useless information, like an entire page and a half of pretentious, long-winded explanation of the experience point system. Also, everything is just kind of thrown in the book wherever, like that essay on the experience point system is between alignments and skills, exactly where you wouldn't expect to find it. So, a 1 out of 3 for writing, Honestly, it is a mess. A mess that might have been excusable in 1985, but certainly not in 2001. So the presentation here is... uninspired. Like everything else, it just feels incredibly dated. Walls of text with illustrations just kind of fit in wherever, and very little in the way of intentional page formatting. That being said, there are a lot of illustrations, and the illustrations are nice, so 2.5 out of 5 for presentation, it's okay, but very much, this is how we've been doing it since the 80s, and we're not interested in changing. And there we have it. After the Bomb, a replacement for the TMNT RPG as the core rulebook for the existing line of After the Bomb supplements but with less content and not being entirely compatible with the rest of the books. Which is a shame, because the new stuff that was added in this book is good and interesting, and I really would have liked a cohesive, self-contained role-playing game of that stuff. But the patchwork of 10 to 20 year old rules, missing information, and just general palladium shenanigans makes the whole thing kind of a house built on sand and also built out of pieces of other houses. Alright, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit all the lovely buttons and check out some of my other content. There is lots of fine content. And as always, feel free to suggest games for me to check out down in the comments. And I will see you next time.